Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Uncertainty and the Human Condition, Challenges and Opportunities. My name is Nicoletta Piereddu, and I'm the inaugural director of the Georgetown Humanities Initiative. Under the auspices of Georgetown College, we promote interdisciplinary collaborations across departments for research, pedagogy, and public-facing projects that demonstrate the enduring value of the humanities for the understanding of the human condition. Tonight's event explores one of the most universally felt phenomena, arguably the experience that shapes our own humanity. Uncertainty propels the acquisition of knowledge, but ironically, it is often also the outcome. We face always new challenges that seem to grow in proportion to the scientific, philosophical, ethical, and linguistic tools that we develop to overcome them. How do we move in uncharted territories? Do we, should we attempt to mitigate uncertainty or embark on this unsettling adventure into the unknown, the unpredictable, the undecidable, embracing it for whatever it will bring to us? Our interdisciplinary conversation will explore various forms of uncertainties, their effects, and the solutions they might or might not entail. And I guess you all agree with me, there is one thing we can at least be totally certain of, we couldn't have better speakers. I wish to thank them wholeheartedly for accepting our invitation. We are all eager for the conversation to start, hence I'm delighted to introduce our moderator, Professor Oleg Svet, to whom we owe the original idea for this event and who will in his turn introduce our distinguished guests. Professor Oleg Svet is a faculty member at Georgetown University's Security Studies program, where he teaches a variety of courses, among them on the intersection of climate change and national security, a topic fraught with many uncertainties. He has published papers on uncertainty, which are also available on Digital Georgetown, and he's currently working on a larger project looking at the relationship between uncertainty and imagination. Before turning it over to Professor Svet, let me add that this event is being recorded and that you are all welcome to submit your questions at any time through the Q&A feature because we have disabled the chat. Thank you very much, Professor Svet, your turn. Thank you, Nicoletta, for that kind introduction and to the Georgetown Humanities Initiative for hosting this event. Thank you, Brianne, as well, for all the help you provided in bringing about this panel. I'll introduce two of the panelists first, Danny and Brianne, and then uh, Brianne will introduce Ruth and Alan, whose works she teaches at her class in Yale. Uh, and then after that, Danny will be the first panelist to speak. So Danny's bio, Dr. Daniel Kahneman, or Danny, is the winner of the 2013 Presidential Medal of Honor and the 2002 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his pioneering work integrating insights from psychological research into economic science, especially concerning human judgment and decision making, decision making under uncertainty. Many of his early articles and books, including Judgment Under Uncertainty and Variants of Uncertainty, were the products of his collaboration with the late cognitive and mathematical psychologist Amos Tversky. He's the author of multiple best-selling books, including Thinking Fast and Slow, and most recently, Noise, A Flaw in Human Judgment, co-authored with Cass Sinsin and Olivier Siboney. Brienne Bilski is the John B. Madden Dean of Berkeley College, one of the residential colleges at Yale, and also a lecturer in Yale's humanities program. Prior to joining Yale, Brienne spent four years as assistant professor of English at the United States Military Academy, West Point. She completed her PhD in English at Stanford University and has broad teaching and research interests, including modernism and postmodernism, world literature, intersections between science and the humanities, and of course, uncertainty. Over to you, Brie. Brianne. Thanks very much, Oleg. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Ruth Ozeki, an award-winning author, filmmaker, Zen Buddhist priest, and professor of English language and literature and Grace Jarko Ross, 1933 professor of humanities at Smith College, where she teaches creative writing. 
Her novels are widely recognized for the way they integrate issues of science, technology, religion, environmental politics, and global pop culture into unique narrative forms. A Tale for the Time Being, which was a finalist for the 2013 Booker Prize and won the LA Times Book Prize, is the final novel that students read in my course on uncertainty, and it has been an absolute joy to travel through the pages of such a remarkable book with them. Professor Ozeki's latest novel, The Book of Form and Emptiness, is a beautiful tale of love, loss, life, and our relationship with things. And it's also my great pleasure to introduce Alan Lightman, an award-winning novelist, essayist, physicist, and professor of the practice of the humanities at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Prior to taking on his current role, Professor Lightman was the first person at MIT to receive a joint appointment in the sciences and the humanities. His essays and novels, such as A Sense of the Mysterious, Science and the Human Spirit, and Mr. G, are widely celebrated for the way they capture the human side of science, with the Washington Post calling him the poet laureate of science writers. To students who always thought they had to choose between the two cultures of science and the humanities, he is a role model and an inspiration, and his work has been instrumental in shaping my own course on uncertainty as well. Professor Lightman's most recent book, Probable Impossibilities, Musings on Beginnings and Endings, is a collection of essays on nothingness, infinity, and our place in the cosmos. And with that, Danny, we turn it over to you. Well, uh, speaking about the psychology of uncertainty in about 10 minutes is, is a big challenge. And there are so many different ways of thinking about uncertainty that have been mentioned in, in the last few minutes that I'm a little embarrassed that how small the details that I'm going to share with you appear. Now, uncertainty from you know, the psychological point of view, what is striking about it is that it's both dreaded and extremely attractive. And it's clear that people are very uncomfortable with the idea of being uncertain about the future. And at the same time, we seek uncertainty quite often in, uh, in literature, in, in thrillers, in gambling, where the essence of the experience is not knowing exactly what happens next. Uh, so not knowing exactly what happens next is, is a very important aspect of human experience. Now, what I was going to do within, you know, with my few minutes is talk about the aversion to uncertainty or the psychology of the aversion to uncertainty. And my theme is that our mind appears to be designed to act uh, without waiting for uncertainty to be resolved. That is, we make choices under uncertainty and we on not only make choices that admit the uncertainty and then we choose the action, but actually the choices are made before that. The choices are made about what we see, not about what we understand. So that's the, that's the theme. Now it really begins with our perceptual system, which seems to be designed to make choices under ambiguity. And the way that it operates is by suppressing the alternative that was not chosen. So I, I was going to show uh, pictures, but I think you've seen all the pictures that I'm going to mention. So uh, there is a whole series of family of ambiguous pictures that can be seen in two different ways. Uh, so you have a famous picture that can be seen as a duck if you look at it in one direction and as a rabbit if you look at it in another. Uh, there is another famous picture where, which can be seen as a lovely young woman if you look at it on one side and if you the other side is salient if she becomes quite an ugly and frightening mother-in-law. There is the Necker cube which is a drawing that can be seen always as a cube, always extremely three-dimensional, very salient, but it can be seen in two ways. And what is common to all these ambiguous figures is that at any one time, we see them one way or the other. You see the duck or you see the rabbit. You see the bride or you see the mother-in-law. You do not see them both. And one thing that is interesting about this is the distinction between seeing and knowing, because you can know, and of course you do know that there is a duck and there is a rabbit in the same picture, 
but knowledge and seeing are quite different things. And in the seeing, the one of the alternatives is chosen and the other alternative is suppressed. And we can really speculate about where this comes from. And in, it comes, I think, from the fact that there is a big premium in, in nature, not, not in our lives, but in, in animal lives, in, in the lives of prey and predators, which is the main role of um, you know, our ancestors. Uh, there, is, there is a real premium for acting quickly. But instead of acting quickly, as a, that is a deciding what to do in an uncertain situation and deciding quickly, the perceptual system chooses. And the perceptual system chooses quickly. And we are not aware normally of the ambiguity. And, and that is an extremely functional, an extremely adaptive characteristic of of the perceptual system. The, well, there are examples that are not perceptual, but that uh, are cognitive and they show us exactly the same thing. So one of my favorite examples is the sentence, she approached the bank. And she approached the bank, you, appears to be a perfectly normal sentence, except that the word bank uh, can be understood in two different ways. And in the context of financial institutions, you'll be thinking of bank one way. In the context of fishing, you'll be thinking of bank another way. And typically, you will not be aware of the fact that there is an ambiguity. You will choose. And the choice is determined in general not at random. The choice is determined in a highly adaptive fashion. The choice is a guess, and it's, a, it's an informed guess about, about nature, about what is happening. So that if you have recently been doing a lot of fishing or heard a lot about fishing, or just about heard about fishing in the previous sentence, you are likely to interpret bank in that way. Probably for most of us, uh, banks as financial institutions are more common than, than banks of rivers, and that would be the common way that we hear it. So notice how, how this works. Very quickly, we can bias the understanding of a word or of a sentence or of the whole idea by the context in which it appears. And we are not aware that in a different context, the same stimulus, the same sentence, the same object, uh, could have been interpreted in a very different way. So this, I think, is really a fundamental characteristic of both perception and human cognition. And it happens, it takes a different form in more complicated, more complex aspects of cognition, such as uh, the formation of impression about other people. And what is very striking when you look at that process is how much information we draw from how from very little. So if I tell you about a person that she is zany, uh, you know an awful lot about that person. Then you know it could give you a long list of adjectives and check the adjectives that you believe apply to that person, and you will check many adjectives just because I said that she is zany. Uh, if I say of a leader that uh, he is intelligent, you already have an impression that the leader is a good leader. But in fact, I could be, the next thing I could be telling you that the leader is corrupt, and then he could be both intelligent and corrupt. But you have started making a choice from the very first thing that you heard. Jumping to conclusions, is an essential feature of the way our mind works. And it's not only in forming impression like that, we have a very strong tendency to confirm our early impressions. So that once you have an impression, you're looking for new information, you are going to interpret the new information in a way that is consistent with your first 
uh, impression. A well-known example is in when one person interviews another, for example, a candidate for a job. And if you have the impression that the candidate is an introvert, you will ask different questions than you would if you have the impression that the person is an extrovert. You are more likely to ask the extrovert about parties, and you are more likely to ask the introvert about the experience of being lonely. And you are going to confirm whatever you do because you are, what typically you are going to confirm your first impressions because you will both look for confirming impression, information and interpret the information that you get in a way that conforms to your expectations. Indeed, uh, it's been said that in those hiring interviews, the way that, in the way that they are normally conducted, a strong impression of the decision is made probably within the first two or three minutes, even if the interviewer is not fully aware of it. And the rest of the interview is spent essentially justifying that first impression, collecting information that confirms the impression that you got first. So here again, this is an example where uncertainty is really avoided and uncertainty is avoided by choosing and by choosing early. And certainly when we speak of having an intuition, typically uh, the intuition is of a kind, it's a choice. It's a choice of an interpretation, typically under ambiguous conditions. And it's a choice that comes with a great deal of confidence. And that is one of the characteristics of uh, an appealing intuition. Now, I proposed in, in a book I wrote, Thinking Fast and Slow, I proposed a rule uh, that I call Wisiati, which is what you see is all there is. And there is indeed, when you look at, at thinking as a psychological process, there is a very strong tendency to focus on information that is available, on things that you know, and there is very little allowance made for things that you don't know and for the level of uncertainty. And what is quite striking is that we can generate a very high level of confidence from very little information. If I give you a few adjectives of, about a person, you will form a very strong impression of who that person is. Although there, there could be many ways of overturning that impression, you have jumped to conclusions. This is the way that we normally work. So in principle, in the theory of, of how people should be thinking about uncertainty, they should allow for their ignorance, but typically they don't. And one of the most robust biases in psychology uh, that are known to psychologists is overconfidence. And overconfidence again means that you're denying uncertainty. So, when you ask people questions and you know to make a guess about the future or to or to make a guess about whether a fact is true or not, that's the standard way that uh, that research is done. And then to assign a probability to the to the truth of the statement that they just endorsed, then a very robust finding is that people assign a probability that is much too high, consistently too high. And the reason the mechanism for that is, is a failure of imagination. That is the reason that we are overconfident is that we can't imagine reality in many situations. We, we cannot easily imagine reality as different from the way that we see it. And that's what part of Wiziati is uh, that difficulty, that weakness of imagination. Now, here we really must distinguish between different modes of thinking. So when I've been, everything that I've told you so far is of course false. It's false under some conditions that people are conscious of doubt, can investigate things, can be uh, acutely aware of their uncertainty. But what I have described is the normal default mode of operation, I think, of the mind and in routine situations, and unless you are deliberately 
making yourself thinking about uncertainty, you are very likely to think, I think, you know, I'm proposing that, you're very likely to think in the way that I have described. So that's a, a major theme. And associated with that theme is the question of what happens to people when they're faced with events that are explicitly probabilistic. And for example, you know, all of us have been, uh, are living with uh, the uncertainty of will we or won't we get COVID? Uh, so for those of us who haven't had it yet, uh, there is uncertainty. And what is very, characteristic of the way that deal that people deal with low probability events with, is they make one of two choices. They either neglect it completely or they put too much weight on it. And when you look around you at people's reaction to COVID, I think that you are very likely uh, to find that people are going into those two extremes. Quite a few people really act as if the danger was acute when in fact, objectively, the danger is not. And quite a few people are fairly reckless and act as if the danger didn't exist at all, when in fact it does. And this is really quite characteristic that low probabilities uh, that we face are either overweighted or completely neglected. So to summarize, you know, what that I have told you, I've told you that there is one way of thinking and I'm not characterizing all human thought here. There is one way of thinking that avoids uncertainty by making choices and that thinks quickly and by in thinking quickly suppresses ambiguity and suppresses uncertainty. Uh, this mode of thinking naturally is, is not the way that scientists are supposed to think. So it's quite the opposite of the way that scientists are supposed to think, but you do find it. You do find that kind of thinking among scientists too. What you find among scientists is a great deal of overconfidence in their current opinion and a great deal of confirmation bias so the tendency to focus on information that confirms their beliefs rather than an information that might uh, contradict their beliefs. So even scientists in some ways think in the way that all of us think, which is uh, they're not very comfortable with uncertainty and they tend to be overconfident just like the rest of us most of the time. Thank you, Danny, for that wonderful, these wonderful remarks. I have so many questions, but I'll save them for the end. Uh, for now, we'll go over to Brienne. So first, I, I just want to thank um, Nicoletta and Oleg for inviting me to be part of this event. And uh, I'd also like to thank my fellow panelists for joining us this evening. It's truly a privilege to share this time in this, this space with all of you. And finally, I'd, I'd like to thank my students, um, former and current, for advancing my thinking about so many things over the years, not least of which is the idea of uncertainty. Um, so although all of us on this panel may differ in our academic training and career paths, I think I can say with some degree of certainty that we all have at least one thing in common, uh, which is that we all work with students and we're once students ourselves. So I'd like to actually take a little time to consider how uncertainty might be relevant to being a student and the work that we do with and for them. Uh, if you're not familiar with the residential college system at Yale, uh, it's a bit like the houses at Hogwarts minus the floating candles in the dining hall. And as a dean of one of these colleges, I spend a lot of time talking to students about all kinds of things but I frequently find myself talking to first years about their academic interests and to seniors about their post-graduation plans. As bookends to the college experience, the first year and the senior year are in many ways defined by uncertainty. In the first year, it's the uncertainty of figuring out who you are and what you want to study. And in the senior year, it's the uncertainty of figuring out what comes next. And as I think back to my own first year self and senior self, it's clear to me that my experience grappling with uncertainty as a student, I think actually led me to a career in which I tried to help students grapple with uncertainty. Uh, my senior self graduated from college as an English major, but my first year self actually entered college as a would-be physics major. Uh, so how did the seemingly drastic shift in academic interests happen? Uh, in retrospect, I would actually argue that it's maybe not actually that drastic. Uh, in high school, I love physics because I love to solve problems and to figure out how things worked. 
I found satisfaction in working through an equation and seeing that my answer matched the one in the back of the book. I got a rush from using some of these equations to build things like a tower made of uncooked spaghetti that could bear a certain amount of weight without breaking or a miniature version of a medieval trebuchet that could sling a baseball a certain distance. Uh, in other words, I think I liked uncertainty or at least what to be seen to represent certainty at the time. Um, so what changed? Well, I would say that the simple answer was freshman calculus. I discovered that I wasn't nearly as good at math as I thought I was in high school. Uh, but the more comp complicated answer is, is learning, I think, to be comfortable with uncertainty. I realized that I liked physics not only because I found something satisfying about solving equations and building things, but also because it seemed safe to me. Um, I, I liked the sense of stability and purpose that I thought a career in physics would provide. To my 18-year-old self, physics seemed like a worthwhile pursuit, a discipline in which results in one's contribution to the advancement of knowledge could be measured with some degree of certainty. So on the surface, switch to the study of literature might seem like a complete 180, and I think in many ways it was. How can people who study literature measure their results or what they contribute to the production of knowledge with, with any degree of certainty? Because after all, literature is language, and language is slippery, it can be slippery. Literature is human experience, and the human experience is messy. Um, but a piece of literature, I would say, is also something that is built, and anything that is built can be taken apart and examined to see how it might work with might though being uh, the very important word here because a page of words uh, operates very differently than a tower built of, of spaghetti. Um, the type of spaghetti that you use and the way that you structure the pieces help to determine the amount of weight that the tower can bear. But on the other hand, the words that are used uh, in the way they are arranged in a literary work can lead to endless interpretations. So meaning becomes uncertain and uncertainty can be intimidating, but I think it can also be liberating because uncertain meanings can lead to possibilities uh, opportunities to think through or see something in a new way. And it's this approach to uncertainty that I, I tried to, I think, adopt when I chose to study literature and the humanities more broadly. Um, and while I ultimately specialized in the study of the novel, uh, poetry to me helped me to see some of the skills that one might use to study physics and that can also be applied to the study of literature. Because poems generally are much shorter than novels, it's often easier to take them apart with an eye toward trying to figure out how they work. Now, this is not to say that a poem is in any way less complicated than or inferior to a novel, only that the structure of a poem gives a reader something very prominent to consider along with the content when trying to figure out how the text works. For example, some poems, such as a sonnet, follow a particular equation, right, an established formula that determines how many syllables there are in each line and which lines are orally connected through a rhyme scheme. So in other words, some poems unfold with a comforting sense of structural certainty. And in my opinion, some of the most impactful poetry actually pairs structural, excuse me, structural certainty with jarring content to undermine what readers might think they know about something. For example, many of the World War I soldier poets, such as Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen, package the horrors of war in highly structured poetic forms. And the resulting dissonance, I think, underscores the war's devastating effects for readers, both then and now, who were not actually on the front lines to observe them firsthand. Although I chose literary studies, I have remained fascinated by physics. And in retrospect, I, I can now see that uncertainty is a through line that connects both of these disciplines for me. My favorite novels are ones that defy a simple plot summary. They, they generally make your head hurt while you read them and leave you with far more questions than answers in the end. And as an undergraduate, I learned that these types of novels had a name. It, it was postmodern literature, that's what I came to realize I liked. Uh, and as a graduate student, I I became more tuned to specific elements of postmodern literature, such as metafiction, uh, disorder, playfulness, unreliable narrators, all of these elements that leave one feeling rather uncertain about what is actually real or true. At the same time, my fascination with physics evolved from building spaghetti towers and trebuchets to learning more about the mind-boggling way the quantum world works. And uh, given my already established limitations of my mathematical abilities, I, I long ago gave up the hope of ever actually being able to do quantum mechanics but instead I'm interested in trying to understand the philosophical implications of quantum theory, such as how it impacts our understanding of, of the way that reality is. And for me, the classroom has become the place where these interdisciplinary interests can coexist. And for the past few years, I've tried to turn that place into a space where students can grapple with uncertainty themselves. Through Yale's humanities program, I teach a course called Certain Uncertainties, Literature, Physics, Philosophy. And it's my attempt to encourage first year students in particular to challenge what they think they know about each of these fields, their own sense of self and the world around them. I'd say it's also my selfish attempt to keep being a student myself, as I believe that those of us who teach can learn just as much from our students as they might learn from us. Especially in seminar style courses, this often means getting comfortable with not knowing exactly where a discussion might go, 
or in other words, learning to embrace uncertainty in a space where you're supposed to be the source of certainty. Um, and on the first day of my class, I asked students to define the purpose of literature, physics, and philosophy, and to situate them, uh, each one of them, on a certainty scale. And, and as you might expect, most students align physics and science more generally with certainty, with telling us something concrete and stable about the world. And they usually associate literature with uncertainty because it addresses the human experience. And then philosophy generally lands somewhere in the middle uh, on the spectrum. And in the opening unit, we consider the philosophical and scientific question of why there is something rather than nothing, why the universe, the world, ourselves exist at all. Uh, and as you might expect, this question leads to many more questions rather than, than any real answers. Um, we then track some of the major developments in 20th century physics and their philosophical implications alongside examples of modernist and postmodernist literature that put pressure on, among other things, I think our sense of knowing and being or epistemological and, and ontological certainty. And then finally, we try to tie many of these threads together by looking to a brand of contemporary literature that I've dubbed Fizz fiction, trying to put all these things together um, because physics and philosophical issues are notably featured in the narrative itself. And to me, Professor Ozeki's novel, Hotel for the Time Being, is an extraordinary example of such a text. And at the end of the course, I asked uh, my students again to define the purpose of literature, physics, and philosophy, and to place each one on a certainty scale to see whether and how their answers might have changed since the first day. While these three tools for understanding the world clearly have their differences, they also, I would argue, have much in common. And it's my hope that with a little luck and a lot of hard work, students will come to see that if we take an interdisciplinary approach from time to time, we just might become a little more certain about the value of uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you, Brianne, for those remarks as well. Um, up next, we have Ruth. There we go. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, for inviting me to participate in this. And Brianne, in particular, thank you for that fizzlofo fiction. I like that. I didn't realize it's a new genre, and, and now I have to strive to inhabit it. Um, so <clears throat> when you first sent me the uh, introduction or the, the title of this panel, um, Uncertainty and the Human Condition, um, I kind of read it quickly and misread it. And, um, and I, what I read was in, uncertainty is the human condition. And of course, immediately I felt like, uh, of course, that, that makes perfect sense. That's exactly right. Um, and I've never been more aware of this than I am now. Um, sitting on this panel with all of you. Um, I, I have to say that I'm very uncertain about this. Um, I'm wondering, what am I doing here? And the answer is kind of, no, I have no idea. Um, this feeling of uncertainty though, you know, and the, um, the anxiety and the doubt that accompanies it, um, you know, as, uh, as Danny mentioned, it's not pleasant, but at least for me, it's familiar. Um, as a novelist and a filmmaker, I've lived most of my life this way, kind of lurching from one uncertainty to the next. Um, well, because that's what artists do. Uh, for the first 59 years of my life, I never had a proper job. Um, in other words, one with benefits and um, a regular paycheck. And then just before I turned 60, I started teaching at Smith College. Um, and so now it seems um, that I'm a professor too. I mean, that's how people are addressing me. Um, and further confirmation is that every two weeks, money automatically appears in my bank account, which is kind of amazing, right? That's never happened to me before. Um, so I feel very lucky about this. I appreciate the certainty um, and I'm very grateful uh, to have gotten a job um, just in time to retire from it. Um, I'm also grateful though that I managed to survive in uncertainty for the first 60 or so years of my life because of course certainty comes with certain strings attached, um, which can be very difficult and challenging for an artist. Um, in addition to being a novelist and a filmmaker and now a professor, um, I'm also a Zen Buddhist priest. And I know that's a lot of hats and a lot of jobs, but um, this is what people who live in financial precarity and uncertainty do. Um, we have lots of backup plans. Um, so <laughs> Buddhists have a uh, a very blunt and realistic understanding of uncertainty. Um, as they're fond of pointing out, uh, the only thing we know for certain is that we will die, right? When we will die is uncertain, how we will die is uncertain, um, how we will live is also uncertain. Um, so yes, uncertainty is the human condition and uh, one of the root causes of human suffering. 
Um, we want to be certain, uh, we want to know, and in the absence of that knowing, we suffer. So then the question is, how do we work with this? And um, in Zen, we have a phrase, uh, not knowing is most intimate. And this is actually the punchline to a famous koan, uh, which goes something like this. Um, the monk Feon was on a pilgrimage with some other monks when a sudden snowstorm forced them to take refuge at a monastery um, where Guichen was the abbot. And so Guichen and Feon have a conversation. Uh, Guichen asks Feon, where are you going? And Fayan says, around on pilgrimage. And Guichen then asks, what is the purpose of pilgrimage? And Fayan replied, I don't know. And Guichen then responded, not knowing is most intimate. And of course, at these words, um, Fayan suddenly experienced enlightenment. So this word intimacy, I think, is interesting. Um, you know, what is intimacy and what are the causes and conditions that give rise to intimacy? Um, intimacy happens when we are not guarded, uh, when we are vulnerable and exposed and receptive, uh, when we're curious. Uh, certainty, on the other hand, is a kind of wall or barrier uh, that protects us from intimacy and exposure to anything new. Um, certainty reifies the sense of self, you know, the sense that I am a self, um, and creates a distance between this self and others, right? Um, certainty doesn't welcome rather it deflects. And um, anyone who's ever been lectured to uh, will know how off-putting this is. I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with the term, Rebecca Solnit's term, mansplaining. Um, well, I actually think that, um, you know, this is a pretty gender neutral trait. Um, and my husband and I uh, both have this tendency. We have this tendency to lecture to each other. Um, and at one point um, I asked him if he'd be willing to engage in a thought experiment. Um, the rules were simple. Uh, every time he or I caught ourself or the other in an act of pedantry, uh, we would stop and reframe whatever statement we were making as a question. Okay. And so we tried this and I was astonished, you know, even though it was, you know, a setup, I was astonished at what a difference it made. Uh, when he asked me a question, the wall of his certainty broke down and I felt welcomed and included and my own guardedness softened. So my, I felt my whole body relax and I felt myself sort of leaning in and listening, right? And so just this small tweak opened up a territory of uncertainty that we could both enter and explore together. And this leads me to think that uncertainty or even some kind of ritual enactment or practice of uncertainty might be a fruitful habit or attitude to cultivate. Um, and in fact, this is exactly what we do in, in Zen practice. Um, there's this famous quote by uh, Shunju Suzuki, who is the founder of the lineage of, of uh, Soto Zen that I practice um, in, in uh, the US, um, in San Francisco. And um, the quote is, uh, in the beginner's mind, possibilities are endless. In the expert's mind, they're few. Um, and so what he's talking about here is not knowing or uncertainty, which then becomes a wide open field where all possibilities exist. And, and this is how we're uh, encouraged to approach our Zen practice um, as beginners, even if we've been practicing for decades. Uh, so that was kind of my Buddhist hat. And now I'm gonna put on my writing hat um, and talk about uh, negative capability. Um, the romantic poet, John Keats wrote, eloquently on the necessity of uncertainty in literary production, um, describing the particular, particular uncertainty that writers experience as negative capability. Um, and he describes his realization in a letter to his brothers uh, written in 1817. And I'm going to read this section because I think it's so beautiful. At once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. I mean, I mean negative capability. That is when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Coleridge, for example, would let go by a fine isolated verisimilitude caught from the penetralium of mystery, from being incapable of remaining content with half knowledge. This pursued through volumes would perhaps take us no further than this, that with a great poet, the sense of beauty overcomes every other consideration or rather 
obliterates all consideration. So the word negative here is not used in the derogatory or judgmental sense. Um, rather, it's describing the absence uh, rather than the presence of something. And in this case, uh, a writer's capability to not irritably reach after fact and reason, and instead to be capable of being in uncertainty, mystery, and doubts. Um, this capability is the key to the, quote, fine isolated verisimilitudes or truths caught from the penetralium of mystery, um, as well as the sense of beauty that is a sine qua non of great literature. And, and honestly, what writer would not want that? Um, talk about uncertainty, the cats are fighting behind me, so I apologize. Um, the problem about negative capability is that it's not easy. Uh, being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts is not physically or mentally comfortable. Not knowing is irritating, uh, causing us to irritably reach out for a fix. Um, there's this old saying um, that writers don't... People, stop. Okay. <laughs> There's this old adage, uh, writers don't want to write, uh, they want to have written. And, and this is true. Um, it takes me eight, nine, 10 years to write a novel. And most of that time I'm suffering from profound uncertainty. Um, it's a long time to spend not knowing what you're doing. Sorry. And this whole time, I desperately want to know. Okay, and here is where a powerful tension starts to build between these two poles of knowing on one hand and not knowing on the other. And this tension itself is generative. The tension is what sparks and fuels creativity. And so the challenge then is to learn to tolerate the discomfort of uncertainty and to sit in the midst of this generative tension with an open and receptive mind and without a lot of irritable reaching. Um, developing this negative capability takes practice. And here I'll kind of veer back to Zen um, because I've found that Zen meditation, uh, Zazen, can be profoundly helpful as a means of training in negative capability. So the Zazen that I practice uh, in, in the lineage that I practice is not outcome oriented, okay? You don't sit in order to achieve or become something. In other words, calm, focused, peaceful, enlightened, whatever although these states might be byproducts of the practice. Uh, rather, to use Keats's language, when you sit zazen, you give yourself over to, to quote, being in rather than reaching after. Uh, zazen trains you to sit still in the middle of uncertainty and to tolerate the tension and discomfort and to be receptive to whatever it is that's happening. So when the penetralium of mystery yields up a truth, you're ready to catch it. Um, in other words, Zazen is not a teleological practice. And, um, and I think this is true with novel writing too, that too much reaching after is a sure way to kind of kill the buzz. So every novel is a practice of uncertainty. And every novel is also an enactment of uncertainty as well. Uh, the plot of a novel uh, often maps an arc from some state of uncertainty to some state of certainty. Although I always try to leave my endings kind of open um, in order to allow the questions to extend past the final page of the book and move out into the world. Um, I also like playing around with metafiction. So my novels often contain a reflexive element that sort of tests or presses up against the walls and seams of the fictional container, introducing uncertainty and disrupting the conventional relationship between the writer, the reader, the character, and the text. Um, and so I'd like to end my uh, comments here by reading just the beginning paragraph of the Book of Form and Emptiness, which I hope might suggest um, some of this kind of uncertainty, in particular, the narrator's um, uncertainty. And I should mention here too that the, um, the narrator of the Book of Form and Emptiness is the book of form and emptiness, okay? narrating itself into being, um, which I suppose is what we all do. In the beginning, a book must start somewhere. One brave letter must volunteer to go first, laying itself on the line in an act of faith from which a word takes heart and follows, drawing a sentence into its wake. 
From there, a paragraph amasses and soon a page and the book is on its way, finding a voice, calling itself into being. A book must start somewhere and this one starts here. So whether we are books or human beings, uh, I think there's something brave about this process. Um, you could even call it an act of faith. Um, of facing our uncertainty on the blank page and beginning letter by letter and word by word to write ourselves into being. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for those wonderful remarks. And as our final panelist, we'll have Ellen Lightman. Over to you. Well, first, let me say I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of this, this interesting panel, and I've already learned a lot. Um, I think that I'm the only scientist on the panel, so I'm going to start with the most famous concept of uncertainty in all the sciences, which is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, named after the great German scientist Werner Heisenberg. Um, the principle was articulated in 1927 as part of the development of quantum physics, and I know that Brienne said that she's a fan of quantum physics. What the Heisenberg uncertainty principles, principle says is that we can't know both the position and the speed of a particle with complete accuracy. If we want to know the position to high accuracy, the speed becomes very uncertain. And if we want to know the speed to high accuracy, the position becomes very uncertain. The principle actually quantifies the amount of uncertainty mathematically. Um, these uncertainties are, are very significant in the atomic and subatomic world, but uh, not very important in the macroscopic world of tables and chairs. Um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is, is not a statement about the precision of the tools we use to measure nature. We could get better and better measuring instruments and the uncertainties would persist. The principle is a statement about the fundamental nature of the world. And it follows from the discovery that at the microscopic level of the atom, that uh, nature behaves both as a particle, each, each object in nature behaves both as a particle and as a wave. The particle-like behavior is associated with its position and the wave-like behavior is associated with its speed. Before quantum physics, excuse me just a second here. I seem to have lost my place here, sorry. Before quantum physics, and this is the interesting part for us in the humanities, um, you could completely predict the future position of any particle if you knew two things about the particle its current position and its current speed. In other words, from a mechanical point of view, the future is completely determined by the present, which is completely determined by the past. But this kind of determinism was destroyed by quantum physics and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There is an inescapable uncertainty in the current position and speed of the particle of any particle. Philosophers, and I told you a minute ago that, that uh, the uncertainty principle is really unimportant uh, at the level of tables and chairs, but that has not prevented philosophers, ethicists, theologians, and artists from enlisting the uncertainty principle of quantum physics to their various disciplines. For example, if our actions and thoughts are not predetermined, then we have free will. And if we have free will, we are morally responsible for the actions we take. And you can imagine lots of other applications. Well, I wanted to shift gears for a moment and talk about uncertainty in the writing of novels, or rather the uncertainty of the characters of a novel. And I'm going to say something that, that complements, but I don't think it duplicates what Ruth said. Let me associate 
uncertainty with unpredictability. As we all know, whether we subscribe to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or not, real people are unpredictable. Despite the rational side of our brains, we do unpredictable things, as uh, Dr. Kahneman talked about uh, so well. Nice people sometimes do bad things, and bad people sometimes do nice things. Human beings are complicated. The novelist tries to create characters who have these complications. If a character in a novel is completely predictable and uncomplicated, she will not seem real to the reader, and then the power of the novel is lost. Much of the power of Dostoevsky's great novel, Crime and Punishment, stems from the irrational and seemingly random decision of Raskolnikov to brutally murder the elderly pawnbroker, Aliona Ivanova. Good characters in a novel, like real people, have many layers of depth below the surface. Good characters in a novel are never completely understood, even by the novelist. If you understand the characters completely, the novel is dead for you. The best novels, in my view, are the ones where there's a bit of mystery remaining. And that mystery continues to haunt us long after we finish the book and seeps deeper and deeper into our psyche, giving the novel greater and greater power. Despite the uncertainties and unpredictabilities in real people, we crave certainty and order and, predict and predictability. Order brings us security, sanity, peace. Order organizes our lives. Order, when we find it, make sense of the world. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say more about this psychological dimension because uh, we have uh, Danny on the, on the panel who knows far more than I do. But I, I would say that, um, that we, we crave order in nature more than anything else. Um, the mapping of the seasons permitted the development of agriculture. The ability to predict the lawful swing of pendulums led to the creation of clocks. The repeatable production of, of the cert certain proteins when exposed to a particular RNA molecule is the basis for the very effective vaccines used to fight COVID-19. And indeed, you can view the, the great project of science throughout history as the imposition of order under this strange cosmos we find ourselves in. So having said that, I'm now going to surprise you to tell you that, uh, that randomness is essential to the workings of nature and perhaps even required for us human beings to exist at all. And now I'll come back to science for a bit. Of course, Randomness is not exactly the same thing as uncertainty, but it's closely related. And, and I, I want to argue that despite appearances, nature actually thrives on randomness. The most well-known example of the benefit of randomness is the mutations of genes. Throughout this random process, living organisms try out different bodily architectures that might never have been sampled otherwise. These spins of the genetic roulette wheel aren't planned and their outcomes aren't known in advance. But without them, biology would be stuck with a small number of inflexible designs and there'd be much less biodiversity on earth and many organisms would die out, unable to adapt to changing environmental conditions. A less known but and, uh, and, and more subtle example of the pervasive form of randomness in nature lies in a process called diffusion. And here, a concentration of matter or energy is automatically smoothed out by random collisions of atoms and molecules without any expenditure of energy. 
Um, for example, if you put some hot water in a, in a cool bath, at first you'll have hot regions of the bath water and cool regions, but after a while the, the temperature will homogenize. And that's an example of diffusion that the different water molecules are bumping into each other randomly and redistributing the heat. Um, for example, diffusion allows the energy of the, of the sun arriving at Earth in the form of light to be shuffled throughout the atmosphere and oceans. Without diffusion, the parts of the Earth that don't receive direct sunlight at a given time of year, such as Sweden in winter and southern Argentina in summer, would, wouldn't be just a little bit colder, but hundreds of degrees colder than the rest of the planet. And also diffusion is very important in biology. Um, diffusion is what allows oxygen to get from the lungs uh, to, the, to the blood vessels. Um, there's a high concentration of oxygen in the lungs and a low concentration in the blood vessels. And it's the random collisions of oxygen molecules that allow the oxygen to go from lungs to blood vessels. So he wouldn't be alive at all without these random processes in our bodies. I'll end with uh, taking uh, my comments in yet another direction. Um, a few months ago, uh, I listened to Bruckner's Ninth, Ninth Symphony. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of it. It, it begins with a, a, a continuous unfolding of the themes. The second movement, the Scherzo, feels sinister, sinister as if, if some, there's some dark secret that's being withheld. But I, I'm really mesmerized by a section of the, of the third movement, the Adagio. After a haunting and harmonious melody from the strings, the sounds become increasingly discordant, building in volume until we hear a thunderclap of the horns, jagged, dissonant, followed by more clashes like tidal waves pounding the shore. Then a moment of silence, then the springs, the strings pick up again, quiet and lyrical. And the rest of the symphony alternates between this me melodious part and the dissonance, and it continues to the end of the movement. And I wonder if the harmonious sections of the piece would be quite so beautiful, if not juxtaposed with the unharmonious and the unpredictable, the light with the dark, the smooth with the rough, the orderly with the disorderly. And of course, Bruckner himself, a chance event like all of us, a random unpredictable collision of cells bringing forth improbable life in this improbable universe. So I'll stop there. That was very beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, I think all the comments were incredible and I, I have a lot of questions, but we're running a little bit later than the agenda. So why don't we, my main goal here is for the panelists to have a discussion amongst themselves. Some of you came with a question prepared. So why don't we start off, Brianne, you have a question for Ruth. Why don't we begin with that? Thanks, Oleg. Um, Ruth, you actually sort of anticipated my question in your <laughs> comments. I was, I was hoping that you would talk about Zen Buddhism and, and the role that you think it could play play and help us understanding uncertainty. So I'm going to pivot a little bit on the fly mm -hmm. and, and ask um, uh, what your thoughts are on some theories of authorship. Um, uh, I'm thinking in particular of Margaret Atwood, I think who's done a really good job of summing up this idea of the writer as double, right? as a as a person who sort of exists when you're not writing and then a writerly part of yourself that in some theories that you would split off while you're writing and that you feel like you're a different person. Um, I think at, at some point she says that you sort of never enter the same paragraph twice because by the time the ink yeah. is dry, when you wrote that, you're a different person. Um, and I, it, when you were talking about your comments of being a writer and this idea of, of living with the uncertainty that, that sort of just popped into my mind. So I'm just wondering if you might speak a little bit about just this idea of the writer as double and the writer as maybe an unstable sense of self. Oh, absolutely. I think that's, that, that's very true. I mean, I would say that, you know, we're very, as a writer, we, you know, and, and other novelists too are, are, are lucky that um, we live in a culture that, um, <clears throat> that, that 
prizes novels, you know, that, that, you know, because otherwise I could see very easily that people like me and, and Alan, I won't speak for you, but, um, you know, people who inhabit multiple selves and hear voices, right, and see visions and commit these to paper, right, and write untruths, right, would be committed. Right, and I can imagine a I can imagine a culture like that, um, and it, it terrifies me. Um, I know that uh, that when I'm um, that when I'm writing, um, I very much do inhabit the skin and the you know the bodies of my characters, and um, and I would go so far as to say that all of my characters, even my villain, even the most villainous ones, and perhaps especially the villainous ones, are also facets of self. Um, that without uh, you know, without having that person somewhere inside, um, I think it would be very hard to write that character onto the page um, in a convincing, you know, and, and full kind of way. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it's actually even more complicated than just, you know, when I'm writing and when I'm not writing. I, I think that, you know, it's a, it's a multiplicity of selves um, and it's very busy, you know, <laughs> it's very, it's very noisy in here. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Does any other panelist have a question for a fellow, fellow panelist? Well, I wanted to make a, a comment, uh, something that Danny said, which I found extremely interesting. Uh, when you're talking about the, the power of first impressions and how we, we sort of make a commitment to our first impression and, and continue to seek evidence to support that impression. Of course, that way of working is, is, is deadly for science. Although I think you're quite right to say that, that scientists uh, work that way is, I mean, have put a lot of uh, weight of their first impression as well. But your comment there reminded me of a very famous experiment in physics uh, called the Michelson-Morley experiment in which physicists tried to measure the ether, which is this hypothetical substance that fills up all of space and, and is responsible for the propagation of light. And they were so certain that the ether had to exist that, that they kept repeating the experiment over and over again, even though they were getting null results. They, they, they were getting a result that the ether didn't exist and they just couldn't believe the result. And they kept repeating the experiment over and over again until finally Einstein had to come along and tell them, well, actually the ether probably doesn't exist. And it was an example of, of what you were saying of having a strong commitment to an original idea, in this case, it's, I mean, the idea of the ether substitutes for your first impression. And it, it's very interesting that, that, that we think of science and especially scientists as being uh, disembodied, seeking objective truth, but they're human beings like the rest of us and they also have, have this, these very strong commitments to first impressions. Would you like to res respond to that at all? Well, uh, I think changing one's mind is a problem for everybody. And we recognize the difficulties of changing one's mind, you know, in, in politics or in religion, where it's obvious that the arguments that people bring, the reasons that they offer for their beliefs have nothing to do with their beliefs. And that the beliefs are not consequences of, they do not follow from the reasons. In fact, you generate your reasons to rationalize or to defend your beliefs. What struck me was that this happens in science. And now, you know, this happens certainly in psychology, but I, I think it happens uh, in other sciences as, as well, that people find it quite difficult to change their mind. And science is supposed to be a method for changing minds but it's not easy and it's not natural. And it used to be the case that people would say that science proceeds or advances when funerals are time. And this is because people do not change their mind. I hope we're improving beyond that, but it's extremely hard. 
And if I can have some uh, moderator's discretion here, Danny, you've studied uncertainty for quite a while now. Is there a slight change in the public mood towards more openly acknowledging uncertainty or are we essentially the same in our aversion to uncertainty and the, in the same way that we were you know, when you began your research? If there has been a change, I'm not aware of it. I think, you know, uncertainty is really such an essential part of the human condition that nothing that's happened in the last few decades is going to affect it. And yeah, so I'll just make one comment. It is interesting. You've written about this since your at least 1982 paper with Amos Tversky called Variants of Uncertainty, where you say uncertainty is something that all biological forms of life have to contend with. And yet, um, as you write constantly in your works, it's something we're uncomfortable with. And I'm wondering why, why is that? If you can explain a little bit of that psychology. Why are we, it's on the one hand, it's something that's so universal to the human condition and maybe to other biological forms of life. And yet we're not comfortable with it. Is there some explanation for that? Well, uh, you know, uncertainty is risk and risk to, to a large extent is danger. And so it's, it would be, you, you have to look at it from an, an adaptive or an evolutionary perspective. And in, the, in an evolutionary perspective, uncertainty is danger. Uh, when things are very bad, uncertainty is opportunity. But uh, in the normal situation, uncertainty is danger. And we are, we are born not to like it. Yeah. I, um, and if, if any of the panelists have a question or want to chime in, please, please do. I, um, I think one area where perhaps in the arts, a novelist can actually embrace uncertainty. And uh, Ruth, you write in a tale for the time being in the epilogue, you write, I don't really like uncertainty. I, I don't really like uncertainty. I'd much rather know, but then again, not knowing keeps all the possibilities open. It keeps all the worlds alive. Now, from a artistic perspective, I, I sense that, but of course, if we say go to a doctor, we want them to be certain of whatever diagnosis they give us. And likewise, maybe in the, in the criminal justice system, we, we don't want uh, those who are accused to go to jail where there's a high degree of uncertainty. But in the novel, you, uh, A Tale for the Time Being, you, you say that uncertainty actually keeps all the possibilities open. It keeps all the worlds alive. Can you expand on that idea a little bit? Well, I, I think first, it's important to say that fiction is fiction and and it's you know it's different it operates by you know according to different principles um and and you know in in a fictional context this idea of you know keeping the possibilities alive keeping all of the worlds alive i mean i was i was talking um i think in that passage if i recall uh you know it was a kind of self referential um statement about the book and you know the way that as an author as a writer it's my hope that the book that that these imaginal worlds will stay alive you know the ones that that i'm putting out into the world so i think there was a kind of self referential um you know sort of implication in that but of course too you know that that's what um you know as as alan mentioned you know that 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 the sort of open ended um inconclusive uncertain books I think, you know, are the ones that, you know, that, that stay in your mind and stay with you. Um, you know, it's that, it's that uncertainty, that refusal to be, you know, to be nailed down to one thing or another. Um, it, it keeps the, you know, it keeps um, the question alive. It keeps the character alive. It keeps the plot alive. It keeps the, you know, the book alive. Um, and um, certainly as a writer, that's what I would hope. I don't want somebody, you know, I would prefer it if somebody would read my book and continue to think about it and continue to experience, you know, um, the, the characters and the world um, long after they've, you know, they've closed the book and put it back on their shelf. Thank you for that. Um, a question for Brianne. So you previously thought, taught at West Point and in West Point, I think it's quite a, 
I can say with, with some degree of certainty, they probably teach a, a well-structured, they, they try to train officers, to be, uh, cadets to become officers, well-structured, high degree of certainty, confidence, and so on and so forth. When you were teaching at West Point, were you trying to sort of promote the same uh, embrace of uncertainty that, that you promote at Yale with your students at Yale? And if so, what, what do you see the, the virtue for individuals whose profession is war to embrace uncertainty? Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, first, I would just say the whole experience for me of teaching at West Point was something very uncertain that I walked into. Um, I have no military background, nobody in my immediate family had served. So I was really just entering a world that I didn't know what to expect. Um, and I do have to say on the other side of it now, it was one of the most rewarding uh, experiences of my life. So it was really a privilege to be there. But um, to your point, I, I, I agree fully that this clash between certainty and uncertainty really is prominent at, at a place like West Point, especially I think for students in their first year, um, what we would call first year students at a civilian college, but what West Point calls plebes because they're the very, very bottom of the military rank structure. Um, and those were the students that I mostly spent my time teaching. So they are coming right out of basic training. They are being broken down and built back up to live in this world of structure and order. And then we throw them in the classroom and expect them to study literature and talk about interpretation. And, and they, I think, are trying to navigate this, this discord. Um, and uh, what we, I think, is a curriculum in the department that I was in, Department of Actually English and Philosophy, a joint department. We really saw our jobs as trying to put, put pressure on that um, sort of rote memorization, turning to the field manuals instruction that they need to get on the military side and helping them to understand that there's so much of a human element in, in anything that you will do, but, but certainly also in war and diplomacy. Um, and using literature and philosophy to try to uh, put some pressure on that. One thing that um, many people might not know is actually there's an introduction to literature course that all cadets have to take. And one requirement of that course is that all instructors have to teach a Shakespearean drama. And then each cadet actually has to memorize and perform a monologue from that drama. And that may seem maybe odd for military academy, but the thinking behind that is that it's really trying to force students to, 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 to be meticulous about looking at language, how it's being used, how it can be complicated, because who hasn't been 18 and stared at some lines of Shakespeare and thought like, you have no idea what's going on, right? So dealing with language, thinking about how you would perform that, how you would want to use body language and how, how you want to communicate something to your audience. And then really just emphasizing that human element, uh, which I think is actually a really big part of leadership, which is what all of these cadets are, are training to become uh, leaders in the, in the military. Ruth. Yeah. No, I had a, I just had a question for Alan, if I if I may. Yeah. Um, Alan, you were talking about uh, randomness and um, how randomness is essential in nature um, and that nature thrives on randomness. And I was interested, um, you know, when I'm when I'm writing uh, a novel, I sometimes play games with myself in order to kind of um, defeat the uh, the, the kind of ruts of my own thinking. And so in this last um, book, the Book of Form and Emptiness, I had this rule whereby if someone gave me an object, it's a book about things and our relationship with things. If somebody gave me an object, I would put the this random object into the book. I would just give it to one of the characters and see what happened, right? And um, and this was, you know, it kept it ve kept everything very uncertain, um, and it kept, uh, you know, it kept it very alive. Again, it was this idea of, you know, sort of the 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 vividness or the vitality of, you know, the world kind of interpenetrating with the fictional world. And I was just wondering, um, you know, since you brought that up, um, randomness. How does randomness function in um, you know, in, in your own writing process, how random is it? And, and um, you know, how much sort of do you rely on that? Well, I assume that we're talking about fiction here. Okay, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> well, I think that if, if, if the novelist plots out the actions of a character ahead of time, the character is not going to come alive. So I, I think what the novelists can do is they can put the character in a certain situation, but after that, the character, the novelist has to back off and let the character do what the character is going to do. You know, listen to the character, listen to her talk. Don't tell her what to say, but listen to her, watch what she does, and uh, 
a, a, a novel that's, that's plotted out ahead of time is a formula novel. Um, some of those sell extremely well, but they generally don't make great literature because the characters are not real. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of frightening for the novelist, and of course, you're, you're a novelist. Uh, you have to surrender yourself. It's, it's a little bit about what you were saying about uncertainty um, and, and vulnerability, that you have to make yourself vulnerable as the novelist in the sense that you don't know exactly where the book is going. You don't know exactly what your characters are gonna do, but you do have the power to, to put them in certain situations and then see what they're going to do. And of course, the, 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 the magical thing about all of this, and it might be about the, the creation of art in general, is that I, I am a materialist, and I do think that everything that we do comes from the human brain, from those 100 billion neurons that are up there. And so when I say you have to stand back and listen to the character talk, Ultimately, it's coming out of your own head. Uh, I don't think there's any supernatural thing that happens. But somehow you 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 flip a you you flip a switch and you 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 surrender your to your self-conscious or something like that. Of course, Danny would be the expert on I'm, I'm talking about the self-conscious and, and I'm an amateur here. But there's something that goes on when you're when you're creating a work of art and you let yourself go and you're surrendering to something inside yourself that you're not controlling. And maybe Danny can tell us what that thing is. No, I cannot. <laughs> well, speaking of Danny, there's, oh, sorry. Ruth. No, I was just going to say, but wouldn't that be good for us? Wouldn't that be an appropriate way to approach the sciences too? In other words, to overcome the kind of biases that you were talking about earlier, wouldn't that same kind of surrender to what is, right, um, well, be effective too? Yeah. Well, it's certainly good to, to get rid of biases as a scientist, um, and scientists certainly use their, their intuition a lot, but also they have to do their homework in advance. And, and, and that preparation, the, the prepared mind uh, is extremely important in science. There, there uh, a, a few years ago, I, I, I wrote a book about uh, 25 of the greatest discoveries in, in science in the last century in, in physics, biology, chemistry. And um, in all cases, even the ones where the scientist was not expecting what they were, the result they were going to get, like Fleming's discovery of penicillin, mm. they had prepared minds. Mm. They were not amateurs. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I would say that's equally important for writers <laughs> sure. to have to approach the page with a prepared mind. I mean, we do our research. We have spent, you know, our lifetimes reading great literature. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> Danny, if I can ask you a question, you're listening to novelists, to writers, and uh, someone from the audience actually asked, "How about the visual arts?" Dr. Kahneman started talking with perceptual or uh, uncertainty. I'm curious, um, you research uncertainty and the intersection with decision-making and judgment, looking at how uh, businesses make decisions, organizations make decisions, uh, uh, judges make decisions. I'm actually curious if you looked at the intersection of uncertainty and the arts not specifically, I haven't done any research on that, but it, you know, it's fairly clear that certainly the art from the beginning of the 20th century uh, in the visual arts, uh, there have been a flowering of uncertainty, there have been a flowering of ambiguity. And uh, so the uncertainty of, of interpretation is an essential part of the experience of modern art so far. Uh, at that goes. <clears throat> Interesting. Does anyone else have a, a question for the panelists or any comments on what we heard? Okay. Um, one of the, oh, go ahead, Danny. 
I just had a comment earlier about something quite incidental. And this is about, it came up in the context of West Point. I think actually the military officers are really trained to deal with uncertainty. They are really trained not to assume that they know. They are really trained to assume that as soon as the battle begins, all plans disappear. So uh, an officer who is trained to deny uncertainty is not going to be very successful. And I think they know it. And I think that's that's 100% true. And, and what I was always privileged to be able to see there was the arc of that development, right? When a, when a new cadet comes in, it is so much about just learning the order and the structure. And then when you look at them, by the time they're ready to graduate, that transformation has happened. And it's really a remarkable thing to see. Incidentally, earlier today, I actually read um, an article by someone who is a, a senior military uh, a leader who was actually saying that for young cadets, the most important thing they can do is actually to read fiction. And uh, one of our audience members asked, uh, says, thank you to all the panelists. I appreciate the perspectives from different disciplines. Regarding the aversion to uncertainty that we all have and the unwillingness to change our minds after a first impression, I'm wondering how the act of reading fiction from various narrative perspectives lets us quote unquote practice changing our minds on a character, being surprised, et cetera. For example, through the unreliable narr narrator or the multi-perspectival novel, et cetera. What are the trends in the contemporary US literature? And this is a question for any of the panelists. I'd like to hear Brianne's take on that. Um, I, I would just say simply hearing other perspectives, whether it's through a character or it's through somebody that you meet and have a conversation with, I think by default, even if it doesn't necessarily change your mind, hopefully it at least allows you to slow down for a minute and think about the way that you think. And, and so it either confirms maybe what you already believe or uh, opens up the possibility to allow yourself to challenge what it is that you believe. And I also um, would add to that question, maybe as a question to the fellow panelists is, do you, especially the, the writers, do you think there is a difference between reading a book on your own, reading a novel on your own, and trying to hash out these things essentially with yourself versus actually actively discussing a novel with someone? Um, because I would think that the act of discussing, the act of actually hearing how people are interpreting something and then engaging in that productive challenge, maybe two ideas, um, that there's something, something to that that you can't necessarily capture when you're just reading to yourself, sort of stuck in your own mind. I think that's probably I think that's probably true. Um, I think that there's a there's a kind of understanding that you would have because you're alone with a book, um, you know, when and because it is a private, intimate experience. Um, but then to extend that and then to you know follow that with a discussion probably will change your perspective once again, you know, and could open up certain areas even more because of this you know, the first impression problem, you know, that you read a book and you have a first impression of a character and then you're kind of locked into that um, unless the writer has done something to, you know, to change. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, I'm all for it. I'm all for that kind of discussion, of course, right? Um, and then I just wanted to um, uh, respond to this idea of practice that uh, the, the questioner Astrid um, uh, mentioned the idea of practicing changing our minds, being surprised, etc. Um, I, I just read um, uh, Stolen Focus, and um, one of the things that uh, the author was talking about there was um, the, uh, and, and I, I wonder if Danny could talk about, might know about this too, I'm sure, I'm sure he does, but this idea that um, after the experiments that have been done with people who have read a novel and then taken one of these empathy tests um, and you know have scored much higher on empathy tests than people who um, you know I don't know played video games or something else right um, and apparently or watch television I think that was the comparison um, and and so you know it, that seems to support what uh, what Astrid is talking about here. This idea of, of you know practicing empathy, practicing you know thinking of empathy as a muscle, and just being exposed to the fact that other people think differently 
than you do. I had not made that connection, but the last book I wrote is about noise. It's basically about how differently people can see the same thing. And, and this is endlessly surprising. That is, when you look at a complex situation, it is extremely difficult to imagine the range of possible interpretations. And there is an illusion that other people agree with you. There is an illusion that other people see the world as you do. And anything that you can do to sort of disabuse people of that illusion would be, I think, extremely productive. And just hearing other people's views and other people's interpretation of something you think you understand. It's interesting as a novelist, I, you know, will write a novel, I'll send it out into the world. And I think I know what that book is, right? I think it's this book and, and I have written it and I send it out into the world. And then of course I start talking to readers and I realize that they have read a completely different book than the one that I thought I'd written, right? And so this is of course led me to, uh, you know, realize over the years that, you know, the process of writing a novel is not, um, you know, it, it's not the auteur's experience at all. It's a collaboration. It's a, you know, it's a co-creation um, that, you know, that, that uh, you know, you engage in with every single reader and every single reader will be reading a slightly different book. Um, you know, the, the many worlds, Alan. <laughs> to use them, you know, it's just, it's so tempting to, to use that as a metaphor, you know, it's so, it's so poetic and I don't, and I think many writers and philosophers use it that way. Alan, I, I think you were going to make a comment or no? Uh, no, I, I don't need to make any comments. <laughs> well, what actually, it's curious because I was listening to a podcast and right now, in physics, there is the idea of many worlds, uh, the many worlds interpretation, and some physicists have an aversion to it because they think that we'll never be able to uh, experimentally test that hypothesis. But it does appear that artists and some philosophers are running with this idea of, of, of many universes and many worlds. What's your take on, uh, as a physicist, as a novelist, on this idea that there's, there are many universes? Well, uh, as you said, it's an interpretation of quantum physics. And the only thing that we know in quantum physics, and I, I would say probably the only thing we know in science in general, is what we measure. And the rest is philosophy. Uh, so the, the, the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, just like the proposal of the multiverse, uh, is is speculative it, it's something that we probably cannot prove or or disprove and but what's interesting to me is that we we want as human beings we we want we want to interpret we we want to know what what what, what these equations mean um even though we, we, we can't really go, as scientists, we can't go beyond the mathematics and the measurement. We, we want to know what the underlying meaning is. And I think that's a very human instinct. And I don't know if anyone else has to comment on that. I think one other human response is, is there's a TV show or two named Rick and Morty where there's many different parallel universes and and I think artists uh, are running off with this idea of many worlds. Maybe some people will actually want to believe this, whether the science ever proves or measures other universes, other worlds, whatever you want to call it. I think human beings also like to imagine that as a possibility too. And I think that's another uh, human trait as well. Um, we are reaching, we're bumping up against the hour and a half we allocated. Does anyone have any final comments or questions for the panelists? If not, I know everyone's time is uh, very precious. I appreciate all the panelists who came. This was a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you to the Georgetown Humanities Initiative for hosting it. Thank you, Brianne, Ruth, Danny, and Alan for speaking to panelists. And uh, this session will be posted. Uh, the recording will be posted online. And uh, we hope that 
there will be some other event uh, based on, on this panel in the future. Thank you, everyone.